Uh, he went behind bars in 1994. He was released in 2014. Sabian Burgess, how are you, sir? I'm good today, sir. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for being here and just telling your story. I do this every Wednesday. I think it's important to highlight those who have uh, been through this justice system and who are now on the other side. Uh, I always start here, Mr. Burgess. Tell me the, the young, I believe, were you 25 years old? Is that correct? I was 20, I was 23, just turned 24. You just turned 24. Tell me the young man that you were before all of this happened. Oh, um, I was, I was a, um, a happy go lucky, vibrant young man, um, working, um, enrolled in Essex Community College, you know, just trying to get my life together and figuring out what I was going to do. And uh, one thing led to another and I ended up and it's something I never ever thought I would be in. But. Yeah, it's it's really an intense story. So uh, you go to return some uh, VHS tapes for some of our right. uh, younger folks out there. Y'all may not know uh, before streaming and DVDs, it was VHS, yeah. uh, renting a video. Uh, Y'all, you go to, to return VHS tapes, you come back and you see uh, your girlfriend, Michelle Dyson has been shot uh tell us tell us what happened on that day wow well the main thing that day that, that i never forget was that was a regular day everything before i left we was just we just had it happy looking at videos and you know enjoying ourselves and laughing and joking and i left out and then when i came back uh, i just couldn't believe what i saw but and to this day it's still it's just unimaginable that somebody could do that. Deal with something like that, and and in which I just did the best I could do, you know. And um, I I just kind of make sure that she got the help she needed. I stayed there. Um, I I just did all I could do for you know. That's all I could do. Right, but, you, you called the police, correct? And you called yes, I called the police. I stayed there with her. They told yeah. me to um, when the police came, I was in the basement with her. They told me to lay her down and crawl up the steps, which I did. And and from then, it just seemed like it was a never-ending story. From that the time they, once I went got to the top of the steps, they grabbed me by my jacket and dragged me on the floor and laid me down and handcuffed me. And then it seemed like from then on, I was just in another world. Oh. Oh, Mr. Burgess, I didn't know this. You mean that day, October 5th, 1994, that day they did they arrested you? They arrested me, let me go, and then rearrested me. Yes, sir. Wow. They said that, that. They, that day they said that I was, it was they call a custodial arrest, whatever that meant. I wasn't under, I wanted, I wasn't under arrest, but I couldn't leave. Wow. And then 35 days later, they came and rearrested me for the same, for that, yeah. And you allowed your hands to be swabbed for a gunshot yes. residue. There was nothing on you. There no, was sir, nothing I didn't on have, you whatsoever. No, they, um, I allowed for them. I asked them. They asked me, could they do a test? Can they do this test? And I said, what kind of test? And they told me, I said, well, I don't have no problem about you doing a test. I said, but I got blood on my hands. Where the blood interfered with the test. They said, no, if you ain't fired no gun, no, you don't have nothing to worry about. So I went on and let them do the test. After they did the test, they took my clothes, they took my um jacket, my hat, and my sweatshirt. And uh, when they got me another jacket from somewhere else and laid me there, and, and that's that's what it was. And there was no residue on your clothing, uh, no gun was ever, no gun residue found no, whatsoever. So, yes, so when, so when this happens, are you thinking, all right, you know, these cops are crazy, but I'm in the clear. Like, obviously the yeah, evidence I'm, is there. Yeah. I'm thinking not only that I'm in the clear, I'm not, I'm not even worrying about what they saying because I know I didn't do anything. You know, I know I'm innocent. I know that something happened to me. And the only thing I want to make sure that happens is that, that, the, that she gets the proper help she needs and that everything else is, is, is brought to some type of resolution that night so we could figure out what happened. But um, right. it just it just didn't go like that. I thought it did, but it didn't. 
So when do you find out, even after you pass this, the residue test, you know, again, I'm, I'm just repeating this, no residue whatsoever. When do you find out that you're still considered a suspect? Because about a month later in November, you're arrested and charged um, with first degree murder. Yeah. So when, when do you find this out that, wait a minute, I'm, I'm so suspect and I'm it not came, arrested and it came. They came to my home. They came to my, my, I was staying with my mother at the time. And they came to my mother's house in which uh, my mother asked to go let them in. And then when I, when I seen uh, the detective, I was like, what's, what's up, what's this about? They said, the test came back that you fired a gun. We locked you up. I said, I ain't fired no gun. You know what I mean? What you talking about the test came back? That test was wrong. They said, the test came back and um, they arrested me and um, they took me to um, homicide. And and um and so I asked them to take a lie detector test and all that, which they refused. And it was just, it was just, it was just a nightmare, a real nightmare. And no gun was ever found, right? No, sir. No gun was ever found. Nobody ever said I had a gun. Nobody, nobody ever said I ever did anything. We ever argued for it, anything, nothing, you know. And um, the the the, the sad part about it was. Prior to me um, going into the house, I seen a guy getting arrested, and um, and 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 I'd be knowing to me that everything that I was saying for twenty years turned out to be what the police were saying, but I didn't know that because they kept it. They, I never, I never had privy to none of his what the police said. You know, I when I went in, I didn't know that they had heard the shots, and and then when they looking for the shots, I hadn't got there yet. But I'd be knowing to me. The police said later on, yeah, it would be 20 something years later when I would finally see the statement and what the police said, he heard the shots. He went, he left the guy laying on the ground and went and investigate the shots and which he didn't see nothing or heard nothing, he went back with the guy. So that could have cleared me that night. But if they, they if I would have knew about what he said, but I was saying, the only thing I was saying different from him was that I seen him and, and the police, that's how I knew he was dead. Cause I seen the police had him on the ground. The only thing or one thing missing that they left out was they had to put me and the police together. We were saying the same thing and they kept it. They kept it away from me. I know it's hard to go into the mind of the police. I mean, I do so many of these stories, but why do you think that they said, you know what, we're going to focus on him? It, it was easy. It was easy to focus on me. You know, you got to think about it. Um, um, Black, um, not saying the races are a matter, but I'm um, I'm in a neighborhood that's that's not you know uh, what they would say upscale. Um, uh, it's easier to start with me and end with me, and um, but I think we really made it made it made it so much better for the police to use me. They knew that I didn't do it and I wasn't never worrying about hiding anything because I was asking to take a lie detector test. I was willing to talk. You know, I was trying to do it at that time, help them help me help her. But the whole time, you know, so it was easy for them to depend on me. So when you go to the trial, I'm assuming that you're still thinking, all right, they have me locked up, but the truth is going to come out at the trial. Like it just has to describe to me what the trial was like. Oh, <laughs> wow. Um, the trial, the trial was, uh, the trial was like no other. When we, when we go to trial, first thing happened to trial was my lawyer tried to get the case thrown out because the date that they supposed that did the test on the clothes and everything was wrong. So meaning that, let's say the date had the, the, the fourth on it. The murder didn't happen to the fifth. So if y'all saying that this is the date y'all got these clothes and tested them, the fourth, and this is positive, then that got to be wrong because the murder didn't happen yet. The murder didn't happen to the fifth. And then it was a, a, a the real biggest discrepancy was that they were saying that the, um, the, the, the type of bullet that the victim was shot with could have came from a handgun, a shotgun, or a rifle. 
and, and, and so they had charged me with a handgun and my lawyer was saying that, you know, it's ludicrous for y'all to just uh, 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 assume that a handgun was used when the, 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 the records and, the, and, and all the evidence show that more than one kind of gun could have could have did this crime. So, you know, it's just like y'all, you know, and science didn't support it. So anyway, the, 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 the judge more or less um, favored, favored the prosecution, but what we didn't know then, you know, we never knew, like I said, I will find out years later that everything was already set to go. It was already set to close the case with me. So we didn't have, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have a chance. And my lawyer at the time, um, Gordon Tapak, he 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 fought hard. He, we, we didn't have a chance. But all he, what Woody had. You know. Yeah, you, uh, Mr. Burgess, I don't want to uh, skip over this part. I think this is really important that you're going through all this, but at the same time, you're mourning your girlfriend. Wow. Yeah. Miss Michelle Dyson, like folks forget that you're mourning somebody who you were in love with. Y'all lived together. How was your spirit? How was your soul navigating that? You're in this it, system, it, it, but you're also mourning somebody. It, it, it's like a um, it was one of them things where um, my soul was troubled from the whole, the whole from the beginning. And it, but you, but you, when you, it's like a uh. You damned if you do, you damned if you don't. But you know that you have to go on because no matter what happens, you know, there's no turning back. You know, for me or for her, and I just wanted the truth. So I wanted to have my trial. I wanted the evidence to come out. I wanted the, I wanted I wanted everything to come out to show that I not only that I was wasn't the murderer, but I was the wrong person and that y'all need to do y'all job, which I said to them from the beginning. I wanted them to do their job. And so, you know, and it's just, it, it just was a, um, I don't know if you ever just been as a, as a man in a position where you just can't do nothing. And no matter what you say or what you do or what you try to do, it's just all coming out wrong, but you know you're right. And that's what you're standing on. You're standing on your right. You're standing on, I'm right. I'm standing on, I'm supposed to have rights. I'm standing on, I tell them that I'm telling the truth. I did nothing wrong. I have nothing to hide. I want to take a lie detector test. I want, I want to do anything and I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to prove my innocence. And now I'm at this trial and I'm hoping this is the one thing I got. But when I'm, what I'm seeing now is that it's not working. It's not working the way that I thought justice and the law should work because it just stuff was happening that wasn't making sense. And let me ask you this. Uh, we're talking about the mid nineties and was the, what was the racial makeup was of, of the judge, the jurors, was it diverse or was it predominantly white? What was the racial makeup? Oh, uh, predominantly white. Predominantly white. Predominantly white. So I'm, and, I'm and, sure uh, when you saw that, you yeah, probably that was, like this. That was, that was, that was one. And the other thing was they had a practice of, uh, <laughs> Back then, the '90s was tough. You couldn't. Uh, it just, it just, it, it, it. You really didn't. You really didn't. You really didn't stand a chance to really be able to get the right stuff to help yourself. You know, because everything that you were trying to do or could do, you had to go through a system, and the system wasn't right. So, if the system wrong, how can it be right? How was your family? How was your family? How was your mother affected by by this? Your, your time behind bars. Um, I think my mother took it the worst. It killed my mother. Led my mother to drug use, and um, it just sent my mother to a whole another world. It just took her somewhere. She didn't take it. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't take it good at all. You know, because you gotta understand, she was at that funeral with me. She went, we went to the funeral in the burial, and she knew her. You know, and she knew us, and she knew that um, her whole life of knowing me, I never ever argued with a woman, more or less hit a woman, 
and to kill a woman or to say I killed a woman was like the worst thing in the world to me for somebody to say about me. You know, I think um, when you talk about murder of a female, that's anybody, but murder of a woman is, 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 is worse than rape. You know, and they're the two worst, most heinous things can happen to a woman. And, and I just didn't feel my soul just was troubled and I didn't feel like it was right, but it took the toll on her. She couldn't, she, she couldn't do it. She couldn't do the visit. She would cry, huh? cry the whole time. And she ain't wanna, you know, she get on the phone and be like, why they just won't let you out? You know, they know you ain't do it. The more they go talk to the people and everybody know you ain't do it. Everybody saying you ain't do it, but she didn't understand, you know, and it would take, you know, years, even just till like recently, like she finally coming around, but, and now she don't really want me like me to be outside. Um, always want me to make sure that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm somewhere safe and, you know, she just so, you know, cause it, it, it did, a, it took its toll on. So tell me how you are finally, how you are finally released, how, how it finally happens when the truth gets out there and they have to let you, they have to release you. How oh my goodness. Oh, oh. Well, unbelievable. <laughs> they knew, they knew as early as the night it happened that I didn't do the murder. But we know that was mm -hmm. kept. But right. everybody, like in, in this in the, in the city of Baltimore, where I come from, knew about the murder or knew I didn't do it. It was out there. Yeah. Uh, it was coming out, you know, for years. But I, you know, I wasn't, you know, I'm just, hey. And, but when it got down to when I knew I was coming out, I couldn't believe it because. When it, when it first happened, um, I was waiting for, initially, I was waiting for, to see if I was gonna get a new trial. And and the process of me waiting to see if I, if I was gonna get a new trial, the state asked for a postponement. So when, they, when the state asked for the postponement, I got the letter, I'm like, oh man, here we go again. I don't know, I'm just, I guess this is gonna be another two or three years, you know, and, the judge uh, denied the postponement and told them that we was going to have, we had to, we was ready to go. They said they was ready, we ready. And they, and they, and they, and they, and they, they submitted and uh, they, 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 they said they were going to have to let me go. And that was, that was just, <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know what to say. I, I just, I just couldn't believe it, you know. And, and I, I just remember walking back from that phone call saying, wow, I'm going home. Cause they was just like, you don't get released. You get released any day now, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. What, what was the evidence that, that made them finally say, I mean, did, did, did they know about, the, like, what was the evidence made them say, okay, that we, he, he has to be, he has to be set free. He has to go home. Um, First of all, the first evidence was they never had proper cause to arrest me. Mm -hmm. they, they said I never ever should have been arrested in the first place. Mm. So that was like, they just took me off the street and locked me up and gave me life. And, and I sit there for 20 years till they say, oh, oh my bad, we messed up. Uh, he ain't supposed to be here, let's get him out. You no, know? but secondly, the, uh, the GSR test that they did on my hands and which they used to convict me and say it was the uh, the smoking gun was junk science. The, the test wasn't even acceptable because if you take if you take the GSR test and and, and, and you got to if you're gonna do the GSR test on my hands and use that, then use my clothes. But they never ever talked about all my clothes were negative. They never talked about the type of clothes I had. I had on Gore-Tex. You know, if you know about Gore-Tex, you'll not find no gun with Gore-Tex and nothing's getting on none of it. You know, at the time, you we familiar with the fleece and all how the Gore-Tex worked. So, yeah. you know, and, um, and, 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 and it's just so many evidence were kept. Like, um, 
the, uh, they never talked about the son. You know, the son, the son gave them a statement and told them what he saw and heard, and he said it wasn't me. They they kept the letter. They had the notes. They hid the notes. You know, they they. Wow. I mean, just so much stuff they did. So I mean, what? One of her children were were in the house when it happened. All of them was in the house, but one of the children, wow. one of her children, saw it. seen something or heard something, and he told when they talked to him or whatever, he told them what he heard and seen. They said, well, was it wasn't Sabin. He said, no, it wasn't him. I seen mm -hmm. two people and it wasn't him. That was the night of the murder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then um, I will find out later on um, doing another uh, litigation, doing some litigation that the detective wrote a letter to the state's attorney and said, don't tell Sabine Burgess' attorney about the gas tank. Don't let him know about the gas tank on my truck at the time. So it's just like they working together in cahoots and we find out all this stuff. It's like 20 something years later, I'm out now. I done did. What, what, what was the gas tank? I don't understand. What was the gas tank? Well, it was, it was a discrepancy as into my gas tank that I had got ten that ten dollars worth of gas on pump four, ah. and they were saying that my gas tank was empty. However, he said he watched me drive away out of homicide the first time they let me go. But my, my what happened was my fuse was broke, so my gas tank didn't register. Register, so he knew the truth about uh, the gas tank. And he didn't want them to know that he knew the truth. So he, I guess he wrote a letter, a note to the state's attorney and in and, and some kind of way, we got it 20 something years later. And that uh, told that they was in cahoots. Yeah, so it was it was just a lot of stuff. And then you know the um the um the 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 the, the Fed the Fed FBI knew about it, the uh the DEA knew about it. I mean, everybody knew about it because it just kept coming out. Everybody was just coming out like, you know, y'all got Sabine locked up for something he ain't do, and people knew stuff, and come, they knew everything. They knew everything that happened. Everybody knew but me. So, you know. They kept an innocent man behind bars. Do, do, do we know why uh, Michelle Dyson was shot and killed? Does anybody know why? No, it, 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 it was it was different um, stories, you no. Know, but nobody nobody never came to the conclusion of which one was right. And it was like a robbery, robbery gone bad, which was you no know, seemed like the closest one. But then there was something about then it was the possibility that it could have been uh, uh, the kids, a kid, one of our kids' father, because a lot of stuff came out about him, and mm -hmm. um, we never knew. And and he definitely should have been a suspect, but you know, at the end of the day, um, hindsight, when you find out stuff later on, and you look at it, you be trying to figure out like, would the outcome have been different? Yeah, he would have been, he should have been where I was at, and I should have been where he was at because he never got locked up, he never was trying. They even told him that I was going to be convicted. And don't let nobody know what he read. They show him the paperwork because he used to um he used to cut one of the um the uh police one of the uh, uh, homicide officers hair. He was their barber. Mm. Mm. If they would have did a proper investigation, maybe Miss Michelle Dyson would have got justice. Uh, seven years later, how do you? I mean, I I always hear that that, that it's PTSD. You've been out since two thousand fourteen. Uh, how are you doing? How's your spirit doing? I mean, is it, how do you get over that trauma that they, uh, the system puts you through? Um, you, 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 you don't get over it, but you live with it. But it's like your support system, you know, that's one of the things as, as a, as a exonerated man, you have to have or one of the things that will really help you is a good support system. And you have to understand that it ain't about what happened to you in life, it's what you do after it happened. And because, you know, my beliefs and, 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 and my support system showed me that, you know, 
and you can't go forward. You know, you don't have to be stuck in the past, you know, because you got to go forward. And going forward is just trying to do something different every day or trying to make the best of that day, you know, because it's, it's easy to get stuck on bad days. And, and I just found out that my worst day free is better than my best day in prison. So I take it. Mm-hmm. I take it. And uh, what always drives me crazy, Mr. Burgess, with these stories is that nobody no police officer, no detective, no DA, nobody ever, no, no consequences for them. No. That's the craziest thing about it. Nothing. They do all that. A lot of them are retired. They're still living their life. They're doing fine. And um, sadly, you have had no compensation from Maryland. Is that correct? No, sir. Zero. No compensation whatsoever. I've, uh, uh, um, he is. Uh, like I said, um, for an exonerated man, once you're exonerated, after the cameras go away, you on your own. You, 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 you know, you'd be lucky if you could get medical, um, get some type of uh, food stamps or something. Um, but other than that, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna help you do anything. Let's put it like this: a person that's that comes home on probation is, is, is able to get more than a person exonerated with nothing. Mm. So, you know, you're not in, it basically, you have to be in the system to get stuff from the system. But when you're exonerated, you know, you free, but it's like, like with me, it was like, I stepped out of time castle after 20 years and I had to put my life together and I had to figure it out as I went along. I had, I was fortunate because I had friends that had their own business that helped me, let me work, you know, or, or show me how to work. I had people that would ride me around and show me what I had to do and, and what not to do. And um, and I had, I had, I had, it was up and down. I, I ran into a lot of glitches in the matrix, but I got it right. You know, I haven't been in no trouble whatsoever. Um, I've been very productive in my community. I've been able to um, help other people that come home, you know, get on track and, you know, try to put their life together. And I always tell them, like, people that come home, like, don't expect nothing. Don't expect nothing. But just be aware that anything possible to happen. You just got to be here to make it happen. So that's, that's you know, yeah. Well, I do want to tell people uh, if they want to donate, you know, we have a very uh, supportive audience. Uh, You can donate to Mr. Burgess Cash App, which is dollar sign Latasha McFadden. And that's dollar sign L-A-T-A-S-H-A-M-C-F-A-D-D-E-N. Again, that's Cash App dollar sign Latasha McFadden.